All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to your drive time show here on TGC and NSHR Media. We are the right guy. I am Ralph J. Chittam Sr. And of course, sitting with me as always is... Lonnie Poindexter, and we are broadcasting from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., via, via SHR Media and the Exceptional Conservative Network. That's right. And with, as always, we have to let you know who we are. And we are humans by race, Christians by faith, Americans by nationality, and conservatives by choice, because that is the only position that makes any sense at all. And... And if perchance you might catch us on that rarest of occasions where we might be wrong on a particular issue, one thing you need to know, we're still always, and I mean always, going to be right. We're always going to be right, absolutely. Brother Lonnie, how are you today? I, I'm, I'm just enjoying the self-implosion of those on the left side of the aisle <laughs> as they continue to go tick, 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 boom across the country um, in their... Uh, just not understanding how they could possibly be on the wrong side of history. And uh, with the prayer breakfast this morning, brother, that just adds more fuel to the fire. Oh, oh I'm sure that before this day is over, um, the anarchists and the, and the Democrats are going to be getting together to find something else to burn, like they did last night over in Cal Berserkly. <laughs> Cal Berserkly, that's right. <laughs> You know, I saw somebody post something that said, well, how could this happen? You know, where was security? It's, are you kidding? The school administration told security to stand down so they could destroy a bit because berserkly, which is what we called it when I lived out that way years ago, has always been on the hairy fringes of edges of the uh, liberal, progressive, socialist, communist, and every other kind of ism you want to throw at right. the moniker. Yeah, it, it's. I was lo actually looking at some of the um, the news feeds, and you know you have these you know Democrat anarchists, which really should be an oxymoronic term, but yes. you know they only show up when the progressives are protesting. You, you know the the anarchists never show up. Well, then again, conservatives we don't riot, so why no. would they show up? As I heard someone say one time, he says, hey, when conservatives begin to write, then you know it's really, really, truly hit the fan. <laughs> well, here's the sad part. And this, is, and this truly is the sad part. If these anarchists and their Democrat allies continue this sort of foolishness, one of these days they're going to roll up into the wrong city in the wrong yeah. state, yeah. and someone's going to wind up getting shot and killed and there's going to be no prosecution. Well, Ralph, we're already beginning to see some of that. I've been following some of these um, video clips of these passionately misinformed kids blocking freeways and major highways, and some folks not standing up and driving right through them. Well, absolutely. And, and the standard is if they're beating on your car, hitting your car with sticks and bricks to the point that you fear they're going to break the glass and bring harm to you and or your passengers, you have every right to drive to get away from them. Yeah. And that means if you make a couple of them into um, roadkill, you know, unfortunately, that's what's going to happen. That's so very true. I saw one video clip of a passionately misinformed young man standing out there, and they plowed right, uh, a driver plowed right through because of the same types of fears. And that young man flew in the air like a rag doll. And then in the next clip, it shows everybody around him now. He's stretched out. I don't know where he lived or died. And they're all screaming and crying, why? And I'm saying, going, whoa, 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 whoa. Common sense, first of all, what you're doing is not protesting. You're anarchists. And people have a different, a completely different viewpoint and way of dealing with anarchists, which are people perceived to uh, cause you harm. Right. Because you know, the king never did this. No, like I said, I was watching the clips, and these guys came to Berkeley last night with the express intent to tear up some stuff because yeah. they came with homemade shields so that they could repel the rubber bullets that they knew would be fired at them by police because the police wouldn't be firing nine millimeters and forty cals. Yep. 
So they're showing up with, with literally homemade shields to repel rubber bullets while they're firing off Roman candles and all other kind of projectiles and throwing rocks and bricks at the police. So this is not some grassroots, spontaneous, you know, um, protest. No, these guys have this stuff planned out in advance. Well, you got to consider berserkly is the spawning ground for all things anarchist, anarchy, right. and malcontents, and everything else that you can think of. So, yeah, it, it, it could stand a reason they would have perfected some ways of, uh, quote unquote, uh, deflecting the uh, onslaught from the uh, constables there in the city of Berkeley. I'm just kind of amazed. Well, I guess I shouldn't be amazed, but still amazed that. Um, they weren't rounded up summarily and thrown into jail quicker. They let them burn up and tear up stuff for just kind of like what we saw in, in uh, St. Louis and also in Baltimore. In Baltimore. Remember in Baltimore? Right. Going to give them room to destroy. Yeah, there it is. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. That's just insane. But, you know, but what's funny is, you know, I t- t- tell me if I'm wrong, but wasn't Berkeley, you know, h- historically the home of like the free speech movement? Oh God, yes. Going so, back to the going back to the fifties, man. Right. They've been, yeah. So, so here we have now Berkeley, the home of free speech. You know, peace, love, peace, love, dope. You know, can't we all get along? Flower children, all the rest of that stuff. And now Berkeley is promoting Nazi-style fascism. Yes. If you don't agree with what I think. I am going to protest, burn, loot, riot, shut you down. Forget your free speech rights. That's Nazism. That's fascism. That's exactly what it is. And um, it, I just remembered, you know, our good friend, um, Pastor Mason Weaver in St. Louis, uh, when he is during his rebellious days, when, when he was hating the white man, he was a Black Panther and went to UC Berkeley. <laughs> Right. I mean, Berkeley. So know. Right. I mean, Berkeley is the home of everything left. Yes. I mean, so, but it's just amazing that they always talk about the right wing, you know, is going to slip us into fascism. But it's the left that's doing it, and they're doing yes. it at an alarming rate. Yeah. And, and, and when you talk to your average liberal, they don't even see the connection between fascism and, and liberalism. Uh, as it's depicted today. And they're very closely aligned. The only thing they're not wearing are the brown shirts. Well, they're, they're wearing complete black outfits from head to toe. You know, yep. the black balaclavas to cover their face. You know, um, they're hooded. So, this is just me. If I'm the police, and I see them coming, that's all I need to see. Because yeah. if you're dressed like that, you're up to no good. You know, the people at the March for Life didn't show up wearing black with their faces covered with hoods and balaclavas. No. So if that's so, and especially, and you know, and you know they're up to no good, especially when they show up at night. At night, in cl- <laughs> clandestine as they were, but they let them, they let them tear up and they let them destroy. Right. It pushes the narrative and. Berkeley as a campus historically has been so very, uh, famously or infamously left-leaning that this is just, you know, and you said something the other day that uh, the fact that they're losing me meaning they're going to pull out all stops. And so I see a time where things are going to escalate. Um, problem is, as I stated prior, bro, if, if, if it escal- escalates the way I think it does, or what you and I are talking about, um, people are going to die. Unfortunately, I I do see um, blood running in the streets of America. Yeah. I mean, I I, I really do hate to say it, but that's exactly what I see happening. Because it's the the, the right, the conservatives, we're not going to put up with being bullied into silence. Nope. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, just, I hear the Q4... For our first commercial break, uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes after these few promotional messages. Be right back. The best late night conservative talk show in America. (laughs) 
Black Heads Radio. And listen, there are no people better on the air to give you the best in conservative talk. Black Heads John and Black Heads Clan. Uh, and uh, we're working on the great paper for certain other guys that have to work here too. But, <laughs> for those who are tuning in around the world to the best late night conservative talk, Black Heads Radio. Times are dark. The people are misled by corrupt politicians, lied to by establishment media, and deceived by the false messages of Islam. A nation looking for direction needs a guide. It needs a man with a cane. I'm Dave Miller. Join me on Spreaker, SHL Media, Under Press, Live Rebooting Liberty, and YouTube for a unique brand of commentary on the unpleasant blind guy. Because the truth is not always pleasant. The bloviating Zeppelin. He's big-footed enough radio shows to last a lifetime, courtesy of Sean, Clint, Ken, and Jersey Joe. Now it's time for him to waddle on his own two feet via the glorious SHR media. Gird thy loins for the bloviating Zeppelin's berserk Bobcat Saloon. Coming soon to Ossicles near you, Excelsior. Good morning. I'm Michael Wright. And I'm Shannon Wright. Okay, folks, that's not how it goes. I think I'm Shannon, and I you're so. Michael. Yeah. Okay. We are The Right Way with Shannon and Mike. Join us from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Live on SHR Media. And on TECN. Where we'll be talking about all kinds of things. From sports and politics. To food and entertainment. To money. Family. And anything else in between. Community, holidays, all kinds of things. It'll be great. Join us from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Guys. I'm Ralph J. Chittam Sr., and with me, of course, is... Lonnie Poindexter, and we are broadcasting live from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., via SHR Media and the Exceptional Conservative Network. Absolutely. So, one just a speculation. What do you think is going to be the tipping point for when people get sick and tired of these anarchist fascists flexing and there's a humongous pushback? What do you think it's going to take? I think it's going to take when somebody gets hurt, meaning that these individuals push too far and some conservative uh, gets hurt. Um, some regular person, rank and file, a mom, a soccer mom, a dad, a pastor, something like that. And it's going to flip the switch with some people and say they're going to have enough. I think, as I was mentioning prior, I think you're already beginning to see it that folks are plowing right through those protesters that block the freeways and the highways. They, they're not doing any more. And Ralph, here's something I noticed. You don't hear about this kind of stuff happening in Texas. No. Like in California or the East Coast eastern seaboard or something that's taking place I have yet to see it take place in Texas because everybody's strapped there. Well right it's, it's not going to happen in Texas and truthfully it's not really going to happen much here on the east coast because we just have a different mentality here on the east coast Yeah. I mean I went out today and I had to you know, run out to the store pick up a couple of things and I threw on my Make America Great Again baseball cap you know, and, and I have some other friends here, you know, in the D.C. area, and their attitude is, you are not going to intimidate me into hiding who I am. You are not going yep. to scare me into compliance. So maybe it's an East Coast thing, and maybe the also maybe the people in California are just a little bit more crazy. <laughs> a little bit more crazy. I'd say 
say except the East Coast, except for locales like uh, Massachusetts, another place where really no more than California East. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's not going to be taken a lot. I tell you, it won't happen in New Hampshire. You know, because you know, Hampshire's license plate frame says "Live Free or Die." They tend to have an attitude that devil may care. Right. And so, but yeah, it's going to take something simple, something simple that takes place that kind of sums up everything, and people have had it up to their necks. And you're going to see, you know, like like your friend Pastor James, uh, David James Manning would say, when white people start rioting, <laughs> it's all the crack it becomes. Right. So you, you ain't seen a riot till white folks start rioting. That's what he said. Because <laughs> <laughs> they all have guns. That's the funniest thing I've ever seen. He's an eccentric, uh, eccentric individual. But there's a lot of truth that comes out of him. <laughs> no, oh, there's, oh, there's definitely a lot of truth. But, but we've already seen, you know, like the um the woman who was being interviewed at Cal Berkeley who got pepper sprayed, yeah, you know for no reason. Um, yeah. there was the guy walking through the airport who was cold cocked and knocked unconscious. Yeah. So so we've seen, you know these these leftist anarchists, you know just attack people unprovoked, and yeah. and you're right. And there's no telling what the tipping point is going to be because it's it's going to be one event. And there's no telling, like you say, what it's going to be. And when that tipping point hits, all hell is going to break loose. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, like I said, we, we pray for peace. We pray that this doesn't happen. But unfortunately, you know, I, I really do believe that at some point, you know, oh, one of my favorite movies of all time is V for Vendetta. Mm -hmm. And um, towards the end of the movie, one of the um, junior police officers is asking the other police officer, you know, what do you think is going to happen? And the senior police officer says, someone is going to do something stupid. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it's all going to come apart. And then, unfortunately, when that happens, the government is only going to have one option to execute. Yeah. Martial law. Yeah. And then the very thing that these anarchists say they don't want, or they say that the right is trying to engineer, they're the ones who are going to bring it to pass by their own behavior yeah they they want um they want anarchy and they want things to, to blow up that's the game plan because they can use it to drive it as an agenda to say see we told you so we need to come in and keep peace except they didn't factor in that you'd have a donald j trump as president so it's going to make it interesting now to see how they roll out this grand plan they have and also what but they're also miscalculating is the number of law-abiding American citizens who yep. aren't going to put up with this crap. And yep. what you're going to see, and it's going to be interesting to see how, how this is navigated and how this is managed, you're going to see law-abiding citizens um, getting strapped and standing on the front lines with law enforcement and the military. Yes. So now what do you do? When you, you know, when you have... You know, people, you know, who, 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 when you have people who are legal gun owners manning the front line, the skirmish line, with law enforcement and the National Guard to maintain safety, peace, and security in their own neighborhoods. Yeah. See, this is what these fascists on the left don't realize is going to happen. Because I know full well if, if if something broke in my neighborhood and you know, the, the National Guard, the police, they needed some folks from the community to provide some sort of assistance, I, I've got no problem step, stepping up to the line. No, and common sense people, that's what they do. I, I got a real good glimpse of that during the Rodney King riots. and There wasn't a, lot, a whole lot of uh, hoopla made by it, except as it related to seeing people loot and that kind of thing. You know, the news was all over that. What they didn't talk a lot about 
is how the Korean community made a stand in California, in Koreatown, and dared those knuckleheads to come up in the in, up into that area and loot their businesses because their livelihoods and taking care of their families depended upon it. And you saw Asian Americans, Koreans, fully strapped with rifles and whatever else they could put um, in their hands on the rooftops of their businesses. Ralph, I'll never forget that. That's right. One of the one of the networks started filming it, and after a while, they panned away, and you could see them drawing down and they had cordon off the street and everything else because here's what the first thing that happens when there's anarchy like that law enforcement is nowhere to be found and when the uh the armed troops come in like the national guard they don't respond the way law enforcement responds so you're on your own right right because law the first thing law enforcement does is they retreat they you know calculate what's going on and then they deploy but exactly. by the time that's happened it could be a couple of hours and your entire neighborhood is burned to the ground. Oh, dude, and it was longer than a couple of hours in L.A. because the police department stood down intentionally and let them, and let them burn. You know, the same thing we say, saw that happen in Baltimore. Right. And so those Korean grocers and, 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 and store owners and so forth took it upon themselves because they had the ability to protect themselves because, see, they had all come from regimes of uh, uh, North Korea and um, in, in the Chinese and Chinatown did the same thing right where they had, they had seen brutality with government or government not taking care of anybody but themselves and I tell you them, them, bro them brothers and, and them Latin gang members did not come up in that neighborhood in Koreatown I can tell you that no <laughs> and, and like you said and that's why you don't see these crazies you know um, in places like Texas yes and when the, and even here in DC they 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 kept their little happy behinds in downtown DC. They know what neighborhoods not to come into. Yes. Because if they come into the wrong neighborhood, Pookie and Ray Ray got something for them. Yeah, you know it's interesting. They they were overall at like, KN Fourteenth around that area. They didn't go anywhere near the parade route because they'd have caught bullets. Right. They they <laughs> right. They, they they did not come down towards. They didn't come below L Street or nope. K K Street, I believe it was. Yep. Right. So, right, they didn't bring that mess down to D Street. You know, like I said, one block off Pennsylvania Avenue in the parade route. No. Yep. Because, well, truthfully, if they had come down there, I think half the people in the crowd would have turned around and started throwing up some hands. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree. And you know what you just, it just reminded me of going back to the Rodney King riots. Um, Everybody has this, this this picture of you know um, black rage and the rioting and so forth, and that was the story put forward. Forth, and certainly there were black gang members out there doing their things. There were also Latino gang members, but I remember there was this white man, and it, you could see from the helicopters. And only it, this is what he was doing, around. He was going up off to get the street, and right up there near where Sunset Boulevard and all that is, and these palm trees that are you know iconic to Southern California. Those palm trees have to be, what, over 100 years old? Some of them, yes. And he was setting the palm trees on fire. Now, I didn't understand then what I understand now. That was a paid anarchist because that whole thing was not an organic thing for rioting. They had professionals going in there stirring stuff up. Yes. He was a paid pro protester. Okay, I'm going to set all these palm trees on fire because it was really that dynamic to see these 100-foot palm trees all on fire at the top like torches and uh the funniest thing is they survive <laughs> well honestly if anyone if you if they've never seen it in, in person it's an amazing sight to see those trees lining that boulevard yeah right but you're right you know and, and we've had these paid provocateurs coming out into what should be a peaceful organic protest and then turning it into something you know, unlawful and violent. Yeah. You know, and until until and until the people on the left realize that this is not doing them any favors, it's not making them any friends, and they stop it, it's it's going to continue and it's going to get worse. Yep. So, like I said, I just my my prayer is always that nobody gets hurt, but like but these guys, they are, you know. They're mad because Milo Yiannopoulos, however you pronounce his last name, was invited to speak on their campus. Yep. 
and they don't want to hear what he has to say. And so now Cal Berkeley has to find the money from somewhere to rebuild their campus because these fools went in there and burned it. So what are they going to do? Are they going to raise tuition on people? Are they going to discontinue some some programs? Are they going to the state to seek an additional appropriation? Well, what we already have a what was that a forty two dollar gas tax that that Moonbeam just signed to cover what was that I, I forty forty some percent increase yeah yeah in the uh, in the gas tax in the gas tax they have the highest gas tax in the nation as it is. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and and California is not like New York or Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. In New York or Washington, you don't need a car. In California, you better have a car. Everybody got a car. Homeless people have cars in California. Well, <laughs> I mean, when I was there with you, you know, in um in in L.A. and Inglewood, I don't think for that entire week I ever saw a bus. Yeah, or cab. <laughs> Wait a minute. I didn't even think about taxi cabs. Yes, yeah, the only place you see cabs is at the airport. You don't see many places else. So do people out there ride cabs or what? Yeah, they, they do, to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Yeah, right. I, right. I remember seeing them at the airport when I was you know coming in and leaving. But you're right. I don't remember seeing any actually driving throughout the city. No. You know, now I I I saw a lot of bus stops, but I never saw a bus. Yeah. So you're going to raise the gas tax on a community where they basically have to pay it because if you don't have a car, you can't get to work, you can't buy groceries, you can't get to the. I mean, you need a car to do everything out there. Everything, and it's all by design. That's why they raised the gas tax. They couldn't raise other taxes. They know people are going to have to pay it. That's just where it is. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, it's, I don't know. It's just, an, I say California is an interesting place. I don't know if I would ever, ever want to live there, even if you had a Republican governor. But it's a nice place to visit and then get the hell out of. <laughs> yeah, the weather's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm born and raised there. The weather's nice. And there was a time when I would say it's probably one of the better places in the world, if not the country, to live just because of uh, what it used to be. Um, but it's a different animal today. Real estate prices are through the roof. And it's on a bubble, and the bubble's going to burst at some point. Um, the only thing sustaining the real estate bubble in L.A. right now is um, you have people still from all over the world coming there, um, paying those exorbitant prices to live there. But you also have something else taking place. You've got... Historically, people that are resident in California is leaving the state for other places throughout the country. And that's unprecedented. That never happened before. Well, yeah, I was reading a story the other day about there's a company that's leaving California and coming to Northern Virginia. Yeah. You know, but, but like you said, but there, there are places, pockets of California that, that really keep the rest of the state floating. You know, yeah. Silicon Valley. Yeah. You know, um, the Bay Area. Um, you know, Hollywood. You know, those areas, you know, people, you know, still want to live in those areas because there's a certain cachet, you know, Beverly Hills, you know, the 9021, you know, there are certain parts of California that are, in essence, living on glory of past days. No, they are. In fact, Silicon Valley, I think, single-handedly is propping up California, and its days are numbered um, because what you have now is competition from other locales. Um, tech sectors here on the East Coast. And then that little bitty nation over in the Middle East called Israel is competing with Silicon Valley now with a lot of innovation. And um, so when they lose their front status, that's when I think the state will implode. I mean, they're worth trillions in debt as it is right now. And, uh, and with no end in sight. No. And, um, you know, so I, I just, I'm glad to be from there, but wouldn't want to go back. Right. But, but I do have to admit that little place that we went to um, up the coast for those fish tacos was pretty oh, amazing. Yeah. No, you go, you're going to eat good when you're, if you know where to go, you'll get the best Mexican food in the world in California, probably even better than Mexico. And um, also, yeah, places like up the coast there north of Malibu. 
<laughs> right. And, and it's, that, and that's, it's, it was, I mean, it's gorgeous up there. But, you know, even when we hit the, what was it? We hit the Santa Monica Pier. Was that the one we stopped at? Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that was interesting. But you could see the strain in that community even while we were there. Yeah. That, you know, it's, it is starting to slip and it's, and it's not what it used to be. No, dude, you got, what, $600,000. The, the median price now to, to enter the housing market, I don't care where you are, you can be in the hood, um, you can be in, in shoot 'em up town in Compton, and you're going to pay six hundred dollars to $700,000 for a house you'd want to live in in a bad neighborhood. And most of these people are, uh, half a million dollars now is considered the price that you pay for a teardown. Right. Well, it was like that little, um, that little hole in the wall place that um that you took us to f for lunch and yes. you and you told us that this is the hood and we're looking at you like no Lonnie this is not the hood these, yeah, these, these are these are houses you know minimum four hundred thousand dollar houses what are you talking about <laughs> this is the hood <laughs> This is the hood depicted of all the rap videos. That's why I say the rappers are full of themselves. Uh, like I told you, a relative of mine uh, from Alabama was taken down to where the area is south central. He said, this isn't the hood. This, these people own homes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, right. And we're talking about like uh, homes, like I said, four or $500,000 homes. And, you, and you're telling me this is the hood and I'm looking at you like you're crazy. Yeah. Right. So it looked as nice as you saw it look at night. It's shoot 'em up central, which is sad because that's what's taking place. But that's because of those roving bands of unsupervised male youth, otherwise known as gangs, at night raising their head, doing foolishness. But um, when well, you take like a um, the hip hop artist and actor turned actor, uh, what's his name, uh, Ice Cube. Uh huh. Yeah, Ice Cube sings gangster rap. He was part of uh, the NWA and all that. When well, you grew up in a two parent household, right in that same neighborhood where we were. With the with the manicured lawns and the and, yeah. the, and, and the and the Spanish homes. Yes, that's where he grew up. Right. Talk about how hard it was in the hood. Right. <laughs> and 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 those are the neighborhoods that have their debos. Yes, there's always a debo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, it, it, you know, honestly, it, it was an eye-opening experience because you told me that where we were was, like you said, a half mile from that intersection. Yeah. You're that truck driver. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that far. Probably less than that, maybe eighth of a mile. Yeah. Right. And you and you know, and you know, Trish and I are uh, you know, sitting there talking to you and looking around and it looks like we're in a just a very stable middle class neighborhood. Yeah. And you and you tell us, make sure you leave before the sun goes down. Yeah. <laughs> and and all we could do is just chuckle. You know, we you know we left our car you know around the corner. We felt perfectly safe, but you said if the sun goes down, this neighborhood changes completely. It changes completely. It changes to uh, turf, you know, turf war, and it's sad. And it's well, it's been like that since the uh, since the eighties. Right, and and this is what and this is kids who live in the neighborhood who are doing this. These aren't people who are coming into the neighborhood. No, kids in the neighborhood protecting the turf. Kids from outside of the neighborhood coming in to take turf. You know fighting over over land for the most part that they well their parents own but they don't own <laughs> right <laughs> it's always oh boy. always foolishness always foolishness right well so you, you you always give me a good education on california and like i said cal berserkly you know i mean i i understand that milo says some really wild outrageous things but still this is america he has every right to say what he said as anybody else does. And you and don't my, have a right to go burn the, burn stuff up. And my friend, there's nothing he could ever say could be more outlandish than what takes place in Berserkly on any given day on that campus. Remember, I was telling you the story about that's the campus that had Naked Boy some years ago. They had who? who decided to, naked Boy, who decided to come to school naked Oh, yes, every day. yes, yes. <laughs> and they didn't want to do with me because they didn't want to destroy his, his, his uh, what was it, something about his personal freedoms or something of it. So for the better part of the year, this kid went to school button yeah. yeah. Well, hold, ladies and gentlemen, we need to take another break here. Uh, we're going to play the spot from our, our partner, Pastor uh, Donovan Larkin. 
protecting innocence, Chicano Ranch. Don't go away. We will be right back. Hello, I'm Donovan Larkins, pastor of Spirit of Life Christian Center in Dayton, Ohio. But I'm also the director of Chicana Ranch and the Chicana Ranch Protecting Innocence campaign. And today I want to just share with you some of our materials that we've developed so that you can, you too can be part of promoting prevention, education, and safety awareness to youth. We have now our our Protecting Innocence t-shirt. Uh, it's a powerful marquee or billboard that you can purchase and wear yourself that brings awareness that children need advocacy. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful piece. It's simply that with marquee here with uh, some additional words. Uh, we have posters that any of you pastors or any of you community centers, you may want to uh, obtain some of these posters and post in the recreation center. It would be great to post this in the foyer of your church. It would be awesome for you to post this throughout the schools of, of, uh, of your community. Involvement is what's necessary. Involvement is what makes a difference. Uh, we know that in order for evil to triumph, all that is necessary is for good men and women to do nothing. And then we have these little marquees. You can take, you can order a hundred of them, you can order fifty of them, and you can pass them around to your family, you can pass them around to your family event a local event that you're going to be at a festival or something. These are very handy, and very cost efficient, and they make a powerful statement. They really make a difference. And then we have uh, protecting innocence um, ribbon. And in this package, it's not only just the ribbon, but it also has a message a safety awareness message actually a tip. Uh, and the tip encourages parents to exercise scrutiny with the relationships that your children are involved with. Today we see more and more children being victimized by teachers, by uh, coaches, and by other people, other supposedly trusted individuals. And we have to prepare our children if we plan for them to be safe. And then you will want to be involved with the overall Protecting Innocence campaign because we're making plans right now to build a, re a retreat recovery center on our 150-acre campus where Shekinah Ranch is, is housed. And you can get this brochure. We can, we can email it to you. Uh, that way there's no cost associated with it so that you can learn how you can join our Protecting Innocence teams. We are communicating with people globally, all over the world, that are interested in how together we can protect children from dirty, evil child molesters. We love to have you on board. We need your support. We want your prayers. And we welcome your financial contributions. Again, I'm Donovan Larkins, Shekinah Ranch Protecting Innocence Campaign. And by the way, camps are coming. So call us so that you can register your child at 937-422-6029. We'll see you later. Hi, my name is Willie Lawson of the Willie Lawson Show here on the Exceptional Conservative Network, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. They told me that I needed to be humble, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I decided to be awesome instead. That's the Willie Lawson Show, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. here on the Exceptional Conservative Network. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Welcome back to The Right Guys. I am Ralph J. Kittle Sr., of course. Sitting here with me is... 
Lonnie Poindexter, and we are broadcasting live from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., via SHR Media and the Exceptional Conservative Network. Absolutely. Well, you, you know, my, my day started off bright and early this morning. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I got to hang out with um, the Ascot Man. <laughs> Always a hoot when you hang out with the Ascot yes. Man. Well, he, he wasn't in the studio today. He was actually down in Charleston. And so I was in the studio, and they ha I was in the studio with three young ladies. Um, one you probably will know by name, Angela Rye. Uh-huh. Um, and the, the two others um, aren't, don't have as high a profile, so I, I'm not, I won't mention them. But let me tell you, there was absolutely no chit-chat, no conversation, no banter at all all during commercial breaks between the segments in today's show. Those <laughs> sisters wanted nothing to do with this conservative brother. Oh, yeah. They didn't even want to speak to me. Now, how foolish, if you can't speak to someone who's on a TV studio set, and we're here to, dis to talk, discuss, maybe debate, how do you expect them to engage on a national level? It, it, honestly, it was so funny. I actually tweeted it out that there's the only conversation I had on that set when we weren't actually filming was when I was talking to one of the camera guys who's a Jets fan. <laughs> <laughs> so these three sisters, no doubt, marched in the uh, women's march a couple weeks ago. <laughs> um. Well, I don't think um. Oh yeah, they were there. They well, well, no. Well, um, one of them, one of them, I don't think so because all she ever wants to talk talk about is homosexuals and trannies. Because she's all oh. about rights for them. So I don't think that she would go to a woman's march because she would consider that discriminatory. You know, because it wasn't inclusive. I don't know the folks I saw at that march. <laughs> it's a whole lot of what she supports. A lot of trannies and everything else there. Uh, boy. So what, what did you all talk about? I mean, you know, was there any basis for any banter or just answer the questions and move on? Well, I mean, usually during the commercial breaks, there's some some conversation. You know, we'll, we'll keep the discussion going regarding the previous segment or you know, we'll segue into something different. But today, it was nothing. I mean, nothing. So you were the enemy. Oh, well, clearly I was the enemy. And and guess what? I did not care. Yeah, well, we need this. <laughs> that's, that's what I care about you going on. You know, and but the, big, you know, the biggest problem that I have is you have this show that has a platform, it has a forum, but if all you ever do is grievances, grievance, yes. grievance, grievance, you have, when you have that kind of a platform, you also have a responsibility to show people a way forward out of any perceived darkness. Yes. And if all you do is reinforce the darkness and reinforce the grievance and don't show people that there is a light, you're really not doing anyone any favors. No, you're not. Grievance ends up being stirring the pot and that's all they're really interested in. But at some point, at some point, it's got to register with the listening or watching audience if their needs aren't getting met. I mean, CNN is good for that. Look how CNN's numbers are falling out, falling off significantly. Oh, they're in the tank. They're done. Yes. They're done. You know, and, you know, it's like, and of course, everything with them is re Republicans, 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 Republicans. You know, and it's like, wait a minute. Y'all don't understand. You know, one of the things that happened, you know, on the Hill recently is, you know, for two or three days in a row, Democrats refused to attend these the subcommittee hearings for the cabinet nominees. Yes. They just boycotted. They said, we're not coming to the committee hearings. Okay, fine. So what happened? Orrin Hatch moved to suspend the rules. Yep. And they voted them out of, out of, out of subcommittee to the full body with not a single Democrat in the room. Yeah. Okay, what did you, what did the Democrats think was going to happen? Did, did they think that the Republicans 
we're going to be weak and feckless, just like Obama? No. There's a new attitude. You, this is what you're going to do? Fine. We're about getting the business done, and we're going to do it with you or without you. Here it is. And so it's, I don't, like I said, you know, we, they were talking about the meeting yesterday morning, of course. They brought that up. Um, that um, President Trump had with these group of um, black people for the first day of Black History Month. And, of course, they were clowning him. Oh, he doesn't even know who Frederick Douglass is. He doesn't know if Frederick Douglass is alive or dead. I mean, they were just, you know, basically oh, clowning. Oh, oh, oh. oh, man, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to throw out the question. Do you know who Frederick Douglass is? <laughs> yeah, right. But, but you know, the... the they did have one criticism that I did say was valid. You know, these photo op meetings really aren't helping anybody. We need to get to some policy. Some some policy discussions, some policy issues. You know, rolling out policy instead of just doing photo ops. I, I would agree. But how long has he been in office? How many days? Uh, two weeks. <laughs> yeah, two weeks. Oh. Right. But then... So they, they say all of this, but funny, they never come up with any policies. No. no. So I hit them with a policy. I said, you know, President Trump is talking about $1 trillion that he's going to use for infrastructure development here in the United States. Yep. Lord knows we need it. I said, as a policy matter, a portion of those funds should be given in block grants to the states for worker training. So yep. that people who are unemployed or underemployed can now be trained to take these high-skilled, high-paying jobs. And yep. the reason this is important is because nobody who makes $50,000 a year is going to be out in the street robbing somebody. Yep. Now, what do you think the response was from those four Democrats? Crickets. Crickets. They had no nothing to say. But when they talk about they want policy, they want policy, they can never run, lay out a policy. I just hit them right between the eyes with one. And they had, you know, but all they want to do is, is finger point, you know, play the victim game, you know, stay involved in grievances. That, that, that has never, playing the grievance game never freed one slave. No, uh, didn't free one slave, didn't train up one black family. I mean, didn't do anything positive for the black community. Just, well, you know, my feelings on it. You know what I like to do to make liberals' heads explode? And you know me, I just love poking the bear until the bear <laughs> loses its mind. Is when they go on to the Frederick Douglass thing, because black folks love them some Frederick Douglass. And then you quiz them on history of Frederick Douglass and to watch them, their eyes glaze over. And I always hit them like, you know, Frederick Douglass died a millionaire. Right. Because they, they don't know that, and you give them the data on that. And then the ones that I give them, I says, you know, Frederick Douglass was married twice. Who was his second wife? Oh, and, you, oh, you know how they, <laughs> you know, oh, you know how they spin that one? Well, you know, Frederick Douglass left that left his black wife so he could take up with that white woman. <laughs> I, I'm, Lonnie, you can't make they this stuff that? up. Oh my God! You can't yes, make this. I read that just the other day. Oh my God! Truth being, that Frederick Douglass's first wife, after he found her after slavery, uh, who was black, died, and he remarried. But right. you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? Exactly. He left that black woman so he could take her with that white woman. See, that's what all you black Republican men are. See, you don't want a strong black sister. You know, all y'all, all y'all, you just want a white woman. You just want a trophy. <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting, and I'm sitting there looking at him, going, but, but, "Wait, wait a minute." I'm married to the strongest black woman that I know, and we've been married for 33 years. Who are you talking to? Yeah, well, the, the, the response is going to be, well, your wife must be a sellout. <laughs> <laughs> She's black on the outside, but white on the inside. Right, yeah, she, she can't be strong if she's married to a fool like you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it is so sad, man. It is so sad, but those are the type of things that they throw out. And I go, wait a minute, okay, he married a white woman, but he's a sellout? 
how did he marry a white woman in the 1800s? Right. That's the point I want them to get to, but they never get there because they go the way that you say. Right. And um, it's sad and that uh, and the fact he was not a multi millionaire. He was oppressed. He died a millionaire. Yeah. He had an estate and everything. Right. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. We, 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 of course, Roland brought up Betsy DeVos, oh, and, boy. and I okay. said, you know, I said, yeah, she's going to be confirmed. I, I have no doubts about that. She's, she's going to, Trump is going to get his education secretary. Yeah, and we're talking about education, and you and I point out the fact that you know you can't say she's anti-public education because charter schools are public schools. Yes, and then this, this woman. She's she calls her church trying to call me out, and then she says something along the lines of, "Yeah, and you know, education is important because Beyonce is going to have twins, and she's going to need good." Wait a minute, you're trying what? to call me out on education, and you're going to bring up Beyonce? Child, shut up, please. Like like Beyonce's children are going to be in public schools. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when, when she said that, it was one of those moments I kind of gave her the Scooby look. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, 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 and truthfully, I have to give Roland credit. Roland jumped her and said, we're not even going to entertain that stupidity. Yeah. I mean, even Roland could understand. I didn't even, I didn't even start to open my mouth to respond to her. That's how yeah. idiotic it was. But Roland jumped her. It's like that's that's foolishness. What are you yeah. talking about? We're talking about education. You bringing up Beyonce? Yeah. But this is the same woman who who said Beyonce is my president. Oh my God. So she worships worships at the church of Beyonce too, no doubt. Well, hey, you, you know, um, Beyonce has her has her beehive. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but you say anything about Beyonce, man, they, they come out, they come out. Oh, you have got to go to, um, black, black consultants, LLC, my Twitter feed. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Um, BLK elephant LLC. Um, and I retweeted a picture that somebody put up of Beyonce's twins, I guess, as when they get a little bit older, like three or four years old. Oh, Lord. Now, you, you know their first child is named Blue Ivy, right? Right. So they have these, they have um, Jay-Z's face with um, pom-poms on the side of his head like he's a little girl. <laughs> and they've named these two kids Green Ivy and Poison Ivy. No, they didn't. Lonnie... It is the funniest thing I've seen in Twitter in a week. Oh, I'm going to go see that at the break. Right. You, you, you've got to so go, go to my Twitter feed and, and you'll see it. And I guarantee you, you're going to come back and you're going to say, you know what, Ralph? I, too, hate the Internet. I'm on the floor <laughs> laughing. <laughs> people will waste too much time on their hands. Right. Uh -huh. I mean, how did... Green Ivy and Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy. And both, you know, with Jay-Z's face with little girl pow, you know, puff pom-poms on the yeah. side of their head, and they both have a green tint to their face. <laughs> I was I was done when I saw this. It I'm telling you. When, when, we, when we take our break at the hour and come back at five after, I'm almost certain you are still going to be laughing. <laughs> so... Yeah, but no, that's, that, that was my fun time with Roland this morning. And like I said, everything is just, it's all grievance. It's blame the Republicans. It's, it's all their fault. And it's, it, it's doing nothing to move the ball forward to help the black community because that's their target audience or right. even America in general. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just a complete mess. So... So, yeah, I got up at 5 in the morning to put myself through that, and so I'll be doing that every Thursday through the month of March. So for our listeners out there, if you have TV One, um, get up early on Thursday morning from 7 to 8, News One Now with Roland Martin, and you can watch me as I get tortured every Thursday morning from 7 
until 8. All right, ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We are the right guys. Welcome to Lion Chasers, where faith and public policy intersect. And now, your lion chaser in the good fight of faith, Lonnie Poindexter on Urban Family Talk. We're not saying that there's not instances where there's maybe racial injustice somewhere. This is America, and people are human, and there's sin in the world. He's the president of Earth. He's the first president to say that America is not a Christian nation any longer. But, you know, we'll pray for our enemies um, while we defeat them. <laughs> you can't blame folks for messing up the city. There has not been an elected Republican in council in Baltimore City in over 50 years. In the uh, co-captain's chair with me today, Reverend Ralph Chittam. What's happened is the social justice movement has now been hijacked by a godless movement. Don't be bamboozled. Ladies and gentlemen, Frederick Douglass was a... A gun-toting conservative. It's not a black or white issue. It's a God versus anti-God issue. And I know those would say, well, I'm all rigged. It's all a game, Lonnie. Can I get the lock? And there are the crew that has the bags packed at the train station waiting for Jesus to come back. I'm going to be here any minute. Oh, a train went by. Another train went by. Oh, that wasn't Jesus. But he's coming. Meanwhile, Rome is burning. The host of the Black Man Thinking radio show. Welcome to the show, Stanley Lee. Good morning, Ryan. How are you? The core issue that the elephants are in the home. we got to do away with the entitlement programs and the things that hamstring us. And that's where the conservative viewpoints really resonate for my generation. I want to welcome to the show the host of the Exceptional Conservative Show, and that's my brother, Kenneth McClinton. Welcome, brother. Lonnie, is an honor and privilege always to be with you. Let your listeners be Lion Chasers with Lonnie Poindexter. If Lion Chasers sounds right for your station and network, contact Will Addison by email, waddison at afa.net. Encourage your listeners to be Lion Chasers with Lonnie Poindexter and Urban Family Talk. Hi, it's your business diva here, Melanie Collette of Money Talk with Melanie on the Exceptional Conservative Network. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m., we talk all things money on a global, domestic, and household scale that affects you and your wallet. You don't want to miss it. Good morning. I'm Michael Wright. And I'm Shannon Wright. Okay, folks, that's not how it goes. I think I'm Shannon and I you're so. Michael. Yeah. Okay. We are The Right Way with Shannon and Mike. Join us from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Live on SHR Media. And on TECN. Where we'll be talking about all kinds of things. From sports and politics. To food and entertainment. To money. Family. And anything else in between. Community, holidays, kinds of It'll be great. Join us from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. From the war front to the streets of our nation's capital. Men of Faith. Dr. Michael Jones, the underground professor. And Kenneth McClinton, the exceptional conservative. Bring both constitutional gravitas and spiritual perspective on today's issues to the most influential Christian urban talk show, It's a New Day, on New Day, Black and Red. The best late night conservative talk show in America, Black Kids Radio. And listen, there are no people better on the air to give you the best conservative talk. Black Kids Talk and Black Kids Clan. Uh, and uh, we're working on a great paper for a certain other guy that got
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second hour of The Right Guys. I am Ralph J. Chittam Sr., and of course with me is... Lonnie Poindexter, and we are broadcasting from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., the SHR Media and the Exceptional Conservative Network. Absolutely, and just in case you have forgotten who we are, we are humans by race, Christians by faith, Americans by nationality, and conservatives by choice, because that is the only position that makes any sense at all, and... Well, if you just happen to catch us on that rarest of occasion, getting a tidbit of information incorrect, one thing you still need to know, we're still always, and I repeat always, going to be right. We're always going to be right. Well, my, um, my iPad has been blowing up during the commercial break. I see you went to, to the Black Elephant Twitter feed. Man, I'm over here in stitches. <laughs> You're right. You gotta hate the internet right now. You feel so guilty because you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I I saw that. It was like, oh my goodness. You know, <laughs> one of, one of my crazy cousins put it up in Facebook, and I saw it, and I had just posted something very very serious in Facebook that I wanted people to focus on. You know, because I've, I've split my uh, my personal life from my from from the business, uh -huh. and so I didn't want to put that up on the Facebook account because I wanted people to focus in on what I had just put up literally two minutes previously that was very very serious. So that's why I went and threw it up on the Twitter feed, and that thing has been retweeted all over the United States. Oh, uh, yeah, it's definitely got to be viral. Yeah, he did, a real, he did a real good job. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's just little green faces, poison ivy and green ivy. It's and like green ivy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the Hollywood types always give their children these uh, unique names, for lack of a better term, and so they they deserve whatever heat they catch from it. Well, and and the truth of the matter is, see, they can afford those children can afford to have those jacked up names because yep. those children never have to apply for a job in normal America. No, not, not normal America. And nor will they, will they be going to public school. So they, they don't even have to worry about being ridiculed. Right. Well, and if they do go to public schools, they'd be going to public school with, with kids of other stars with equally jacked up names. Yeah, that's true. Right. But, you know, they'll never have to go on an interview, you know, for for a job as a secretary or a school teacher and have to go in and go, what's your name? Oh, my name is Blue Ivy. You know, they, they live a completely sheltered, cloistered existence where names like that mean absolutely nothing. You know, it, it, when, when, you were, when you were in the tech industry, well, the tech industry is kind of different because you have a lot of free spirits out there. Well, when I was, when I was working in the legal field, you know, if somebody came in with something like Blue Ivy, the first the first thing you do is you look at the resume. You go Blue Ivy, what is that? You know, and then you start, you know, you look through the resume, and you know, there's no guarantee that with a name like that you're going to get an interview. Yep. Now you can, you can say it's discrimination. You can say whatever it is that you want to say, but unfortunately, that's the way the world works. Let me tell you something. In tech, the only people that got a free pass were uh, Unix developers and code writers back in the day, because they were a strange group. They show up with spiked hair and everything else, but they never allow those individuals to be in the public eye. They put them in a back room somewhere and slide pizza to them underneath the door <laughs> and let the main main thing um, Mountain Dew. And, and I am not I'm not uh, exaggerating. That's literally what they would do. They were in a room because we're a different breed. Right. There's not a whole lot of verbal skills. There's not a lot, not a whole lot of social commentary between you and a Unix code writer and many of the developers. But for everybody else out there, it, it was pretty much business etiquette one on one, with the exception that because of Jobs and his crew and what they brought to the tech industry, um, you know, you're not frowned upon if you didn't wear ties. Right. But you're, but you're right. Those kind of people, right? 
and I bet they almost had a separate entrance for them to come into the workplace. Oh, yes. You did not want those guys walking through the front door of any business. Right. They did not come through the <laughs> lobby. No. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> Right, and most of them were probably happy because it probably got them out of their mama's basement. Oh God, yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, when you when you meet these young people, and well, they're not young anymore. So some years ago, and uh, I tell you one quick story because you know I'm good for those. Is uh, he had one uh, young man. He and his wife both worked for Cisco Systems back when Cisco was growing in leaps and bounds and acquiring up to fifty companies a year. Um, and they both worked for startups. Um, that Cisco acquired, and they were still living at home. They got married. They were still living at, I believe, the husband's parents' house in the basement, literally. Right. And yet, on paper, combined stock offerings and everything else, the couple was worth about three or four million dollars. And the only thing they splurged on was he went out and bought himself some fancy Trans Am, <laughs> Farber Trans Am. That was it. I will never forget that as a guy, you could start your own business, but this is all he cared about. And uh, they went about their merry way, little strange couple that they were, but, you know, different priorities. And, and here's the deal. These types of opportunities were offered to anybody. They had no difference. If you could have a kid walk through with spiked hair and studs through his nose and his ear, paying $200 an hour, they didn't care if you're white, black, Puerto Rican, spotted, or whatever – long as you had the skill set. Right. If, if you could write code, that's all that mattered. That's all that mattered. And, I, and, and truthfully, you know, that's all that should matter except for the reality that they had these kids locked in a back room. Yep. Because they, they, they did not have the social skills to interact with the public. That's it. Right. So, so you write code, you eat pizza, you, make, you, you chug Mountain Dew, and you probably didn't even speak to many people during the course of the day, include, including your co-coders, because they couldn't even and, talk and, to each other. And when you walk by the room where they were, you know they didn't shower either. I mean, it was, it was a different world, and I, I learned so much from that. And that's why I said, okay, look, I mean, see, only in America, you know, um, you know, we can talk about racism. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. You and I have talked about that ad nauseum on the show and uh, on my show. Shameless plug number one, uh, Lion Chasers Radio, Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern on Urban Family Talk. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you have a talent, if you have a skill that's in demand, they don't care what you look like. And the power that comes with that, Ralph, is intoxicating. Because during my tenure in um, Silicon Valley, it was about a 20-year run there, um, I got job offers at one point. I was getting job offers about every two weeks. Yeah. And this went on month in, month out for a number of years. And what it did, it gave me the big head. I started thinking it was all, all about me. But what I did learn is the only reason why they were doing that was not to fulfill some type of uh, quota for uh, affirmative action. It's because I had a skill set that was in demand. Yep. And, and that's the way Silicon Valley um, operated. Now, one thing that bothers me, though, about Silicon Valley, and, and now that I have to admit, is the number of H-1B visas that they use to bring in foreign workers when we have universities cranking out American citizens who can yep. do those jobs. Yep. So, so right now, I have a huge problem with Silicon Valley because they're bringing in like I said, these foreign H-1Bs paying them less than their skill demands, and our universities are cranking out, you know, um, app developers and code writers and everything else, and they can't get hired because Silicon Valley is basically living off of international cheap labor. Yes, and that's true, and, and I know we're going to be going to a break, so um, I'll explain why they did that um, after the break because there was a reason why they went that direction because I was there um, when all that first started jumping off which was um, I'd say I, I got involved in the 80s uh, but the 90s is when they started doing it um, alright well as you said we're coming up on our on our break um, you have to as you say you know play some more promos for the other shows on SHR and PECN so ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We will be 
right back. The bloviating Zeppelin. He's Bigfooted enough radio shows to last a lifetime, courtesy of Sean, Clint, Ken, and Jersey Joe. Now it's time for him to waddle on his own two feet via the glorious SHR media. Gird thy loins for the bloviating Zeppelin's berserk Bobcat Saloon, coming soon to Ossicles near you, Excelsior. Welcome to Lion Chasers, where faith and public policy intersect. And now, your Lion Chaser in the good fight of faith, Lonnie Poindexter on Urban Family Talk. We're not saying that there's not instances where there's maybe racial injustice somewhere. This is America, and people are human, and there's sin in the world. He's the president of Earth. He's the first president to say that America is not a Christian nation in the world. But you know, we'll pray for our enemies um, while we defeat them. <laughs> you can't blame folks for messing up the city. That has not been an elected Republican in time from that in the city in about 50 years. In the uh, co captain's chair with me today, Reverend Ralph Chittums. What's happened is the social justice movement has now been hijacked by a godless movement. Don't be bamboozled. Ladies and gentlemen, Frederick Douglass was a gun toting conservative. <laughs> It's not a black or white issue. It's a God versus anti God issue. And I know those would say, well, I'm all rude. It's all a game, Lonnie. Can I get that a lot? And there are the crew that has the badge pack at the train station. They just come back. I'll be here in a minute. I'm not training my house. But he's coming. Meanwhile, Rome is done. The host of the Black Man Thinking Radio Show. Welcome to the show, Stanley Lee. Good morning, Lonnie. How are you? The core issues to build elephants are in the home. We've got to do away with the entitlement programs and the things that hamstring us. And that's where the conservative viewpoints really resonate for my generation. I want to welcome to the show the host of the exceptional conservative show, and that's my brother Kenneth McClinton. Welcome, brother. Lonnie, it's an honor and privilege always to be with you. Let your listeners do Lion Chasers with Lonnie Poindexter. If Lion Chasers sounds right for your station network, contact Will Addison by email, wadison at afa.net. Encourage your listeners to do Lion Chasers with Lonnie Poindexter and Urban Family Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back to the right guys. I am Ralph J. Chittum Sr., and of course with me is... I'm Lonnie Poindexter, and we are broadcasting from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., via FHR Media and the Exceptional Conservative Network. Absolutely. Well, today, this morning, there was another event um, here in Washington, D.C. It occurs every year, the first Thursday in February... And it is the National Prayer Breakfast. Yes, yes. Hey, Ralph, can I jump back and finish up my thought? Oh, sure. Yes, yes. Because I wanted to finish that out concerning Silicon Valley. Yeah, go right like, ahead. The reason why they ended up going to those other nations and end up taking advantage of that cheap labor that was there is there was no farm system in place, and there still isn't, um, in America other than the, uh, the universities in America to, uh, to produce students or potential workers that had the skill sets they were looking for. And so they had to go international to find the skill sets to meet the demand, to write the code for the programs because of the industry growing as quickly as it did. It became a treasure trove for them because they saved money. Um, but they, I remember there in California, them petitioning the school districts and so forth about developing programs that will allow uh, the school districts to produce students and so forth that were tech ready at graduation from high school, like you would find in Germany, like you would find in India, like you would find in other locations, Malaysia, throughout the world. So there and again, because you and I, I both know school systems are run by who? Guess who? Democrats. Yep. Liberals. Liberals. And, and they did not meet the demand. Well, because as far as um, Washington, um, as far as the United States is concerned, Everybody's supposed to go to college. Mm -hmm. So creating a workforce that's job ready coming out of high school is not something that they consider to be 
of critical importance because everyone's supposed to go to college anyway. Yeah. But that's but that's a lie. Not everyone is cut out for college. And what they did at the front end is they they created this monster, and now um, Silicon Valley is hooked on it. And now that you do have a farm system that's producing Americans who can't fill these jobs, they're sticking with, with their tried and true, and now these Americans can't get hired. You know, again, we shot ourselves in the foot with the short-sighted, elitist mindset. You have some schools in Silicon Valley, in Santa Clara specifically, that have adopted some programs, but those handful of school districts in and around Silicon Valley broke, could not even meet the need that they need nationally for, um, for students that come out job-ready to fulfill those positions. And those positions pay good money, like I was stating for prior, man, you had Unix code writers making $200 an hour, man, and they had back-up work job offers everywhere. Right, right. But like I said, but the but the arrogance of, of the leftists in the school system run by the unions were more concerned with keeping teachers employed than producing students who were ready for either the workforce or higher education. Or higher education. You know, it should have been an either or, you know, meaning that, you know, a, a child would, should have the option to have chosen one track or the other, but the unions and the teachers and the universities decided that there was only going to be one option. There it is. Just like they killed the industrial arts programs, you know, in the same schools. So you got kids now that, you know, a good welder man can make darn near six <laughs> figures. Um... <laughs> Okay, not, my turn now for a little story. Um, you know, in, in our house we have uh, an attic, and to get and so there was a, a trap door to get into the attic, and what you would have to do when we first bought the house is you'd have to climb a ladder, you know, pop the hatch, and then literally you know jump, pull yourself up into the attic. Okay, so. A few years ago, I'm looking at this going, you know what? If I stay in this house, there's going to come a time when I am, one, not going to feel like jumping and pulling my body up into that attic. Right. And number two, I'm not going to be able <laughs> to jump and pull myself up into this attic. So we decided we were going to contact some guys to come in and install a drop ladder to the attic. So now all you have to do is, you know, you pull the string, you, you know, and the ladder just falls out of the attic. You unfold it. You just walk up the ladder. You go right into the attic. Yes. Easy peasy, no problem. We had to go all the way to West Virginia to find people who could do that work. Mm. West, for, we live in Washington, D.C., and I had to go to West Virginia, and when I tell you, these two mountain boys <laughs> came up in our house. Yep. My, look, one of their names, I will never forget his name as long as I live. His name, no joke, was John Paul Jones. Of course. <laughs> They, they came in looking like they were mini ZZ tops. You know, they, they didn't have the full, like they were still working on the beards. But these were some good old boys from West Virginia who they were masters with, with the woodworking. Yeah. And in stock, they came in and they, they did that work in, in half a day. Mm -hmm. Half a day. But we had to go to West Virginia you know, Trisha's uh, parents, they have a house that has wrought iron steps in the front of the house. Well, and well, you know, no matter how it is, at some point, you know, it's going to get weak and it's going to break. And you need to get it yep. re-welded and, and yada and all that kind of stuff and repainted. Same problem. They had to go as far as West Virginia to get somebody to come in and fix and weld their steps. Why aren't those trades being taught 
inside of DC public schools because there are lots and lots of homes that could use all of those services and you could make a good living for yourself and your family. You certainly could, but as I speak for California, again, because I'm most uh, knowledgeable in that area, they killed the industrial arts programs because of the cost and the liability, listening to lawyers, you know, who they keep on retainer every month. And um, it's, 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 a, it's a crying shame because we have all these workers, and so it's going to take somebody with the leadership like of a Trump to address the fact that we've got a generation of young people out there that are not trained to compete in the workforce when there are jobs out there. You have to go to West Virginia. I, I, can you believe that? In a city like D.C., where there's all these historic buildings and everything everywhere, you'd think there would be plenty of people to choose from. But not anymore. Those no. People have all died off. Oh, absolutely. That's it. You want to know what's almost impossible to find in Washington, D.C. anymore? What's that? A piano tuner. Whoa. A P you and most piano tuners, I'm serious, the average age of a piano tuner has got to be almost 70. Right. Do you know how many pianos there are in the District of Columbia? No. <laughs> think, about, think about all the universities that have fine arts departments. Oh, my goodness. Think about the schools. Then think about all the homes that you've been in with, where you've seen pianos. There's got to be a million pianos in Washington, D.C. I, I would agree. You just said something. You can't throw a rock in D.C. without hitting the campus of some university somewhere. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so here you have this Washington, D.C., and you have to search and make appointments to get a piano tuner. And when the dude comes in, he looks like Mr. Wiggins from the um from um what is it um from the cowboy net show oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he's not cheap either <laughs> right and, and and that's the point there are all of these jobs out here that americans can fill except in our arrogance we don't train or teach people to do them and, and so we have to go literally 200, 150 miles, 200 miles outside of the city to find somebody who could do the work when I would love to have hired somebody who lived in Washington, D.C. So, so yeah, so that, that's like I said, that's the one thing I have about Silicon Valley and the H-1B visa program. And, and it's not just Silicon Valley. I have a problem with that program, period, across the board. Because you can't tell me that you can't find qualified Americans to do any job that you're bringing in somebody from, from overseas to do, especially in the nursing field. Yeah, in the nursing field, they started to do the same thing that they did in Silicon Valley. And, um, uh, and, and then the other thing, I have a, a, a lady friend of mine in California that complains and says that uh, they recruit overseas because they want bilingual uh, health care workers, and they overlook uh, qualified health care workers in the U.S. because they don't speak more than one language. And as she would tell me, she says, I'm an American. Since when does it the predicate of me speaking Spanish when I live in a country that speaks American, that speaks English, simply because there's a large influx of individuals who aren't here legally that we have to provide health care to, and they don't speak English. I have a problem with that. Okay. So, so do you think Donald Trump is going to sign an executive order making English the national language? You know, he shouldn't have to. But <laughs> I hope he does. It should be already the law. I mean, I mean, I've, I've never understood why English is not the official language of this country. It is in every other every other country has. Um, um, you go to Mexico, you know what the official language is there, and they'll straight up tell you. Right. Exactly. Well, see, the problem is. The United States is one of the few nations on the face of the earth where most of its population is unilingual. Yep. You know, most countries, people speak at, at least two, if not three, languages. You know, look at, the, look at our first lady. She speaks five. You know, so, but you, but the United States is one of the few nations on the face of the earth, and it's due to our arrogance, where we go to a foreign country and we expect you to speak English. Mm -hmm. You know, so, 
I mean, even like when I took my vacation to Spain, my Spanish is not, it's not good. You know, I studied it for a number of years, but it's one of those things that if you don't use it, you know, you forget it. But what I learned is if you make an effort to speak the language and they see that you have some understanding of the language and you're trying to speak it, they'll work with you. But if you just walk up to them and say, do you speak English? You're going to have a problem. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with that. You know, cause even my wife was surprised that, you know, towards the end of the trip, you know, I would break off from her and I'd be able to go buy something and come back. And she'd go, where'd you get that? I said, I got it from the stand. And she just looked at me and said, yeah, I, I can transact a little business in Spanish because she's fluent. And no, my wife is not Hispanic. She's American born and she's black, but she speaks three languages. Thank you very much. I don't know. I don't know. You, you, you're a Republican and all, so your wife must be white. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I, I, had, I had to get my trophy. <laughs> you know, my wife is one of those people who has an affinity for languages. She, she speaks um, Spanish fluently. Um, French, she's sort of conversational. Italian, she's okay. Of course, English. Now, she doesn't speak Korean, but she understands it. Because um, when she was growing up, she was around... Um, one of her friends is Korean, and her Korean grandmother didn't speak any English. So Trish understands Korean, but she can't speak it. Which is kind of weird, but hey, that's just the way it is. But no, she's just one of these people, one of the few Americans that I know that honestly is multilingual, because most Americans aren't. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a gift. I commend her for it. Um, I took Spanish in school. I couldn't tell you one thing. I uh, Well, I remember my Spanish name was Guido. That's about all I remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, one, well, one of my daughters um, is, is, almost, is almost fluent in Italian. Um, and that's just simply because she just loves the country. Uh -huh. if, if she could, she'd moved, she'd moved to Italy and we'd never see her again. Right. I mean, when she went to Rome, she came back and was like, I could live there. <laughs> so uh, she may well be an expat at some point in the future and Italy would be her home. So, all right. So let, let's chat briefly about this National Prayer Breakfast and Donald J. Trump. The president of the United States hit some home runs. To, oh, he didn't hit home runs today. He hit grand slams. He hit some grand slams. You know, um, he, he ran the kickoff back 110 yards for a touchdown. Yes. I mean, what, what do you call it? Uh, what, in soccer? What, he, he bicycle kicked a goal? I mean, <laughs> whatever sport you want to use, what he did today was at the top level of whatever sports analogy you, you want. Yeah, and if, it, if, it, if it was soccer, you have the sports commentator in Spanish, you don't know what he's saying other than he said, Go! Go, go, go! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you ran out of air there, brother. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this prayer breakfast, he stood at the podium and basically said religious liberty is a foundational underpinning of this nation and it will not be undermined under my watch. And that's trending on Twitter, brother. I want you to know Twitter is blowing up based on that one comment that he made at the breakfast. Right. Now, what he said, then he also said, you know, this country is open to anyone who wishes to come here, who loves America, and loves our values. Now, what is wrong with that? I'm over here doing my holiness dance, brother. Right. If, if you don't want to come over here and embrace the values of this country, then why do you want to come here in the first place? If, if where you are is so great and you like that culture, then stay there. But if you come to America, you become an American with everything that that entails. I, I don't have a problem with that. I got a problem with that. You, you don't hear me talking. You know, I, I'm seldom at a, lot, a loss of words. I have nothing to say other than amen. Right. right. And then 
the, the biggest bombshell of the prayer breakfast was when he said flat out, I will repeal the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment. And for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with the Johnson Amendment, the Johnson Amendment is the um, law which prevents uh, members of the clergy from endorsing candidates or engaging in partisan politics. So the Johnson Amendment lets um, you know churches and pastors um, get involved in issues. So a pastor, of course, as you hear us all the time speaking on the issue of abortion and you know the death penalty and other issues, but the Johnson Amendment prevents a preacher from standing up in his pulpit and saying, Donald Trump should be the president of the United States and Hillary Clinton I do not recommend that any of my members vote for her. That's right. In addition to that, any 501c3 organization, very church organization or otherwise. It was originally applied to 501c3, non-3, excuse me, 501c3s, but then morphed into covering all churches. And you and I both know, Pastor, that a church technically does not have to have a 501c3 to even be a church because you're granted tax-exempt status via the founding documents of our nation. But it's all muddy together now. So I'm loving Donald J. Trump for that one thing alone. Because I've always said that of all the things he's standing for and the other core things that make America great and the things that have defanged the church, it's been the implementation of the Johnson Amendment. Right. So, he, so I mean, literally, he doubled down on it. He said that the Johnson Amendment is going to disappear. Yeah. So... You know, churches. Well, and what's funny is, you know, it's the liberals who have been ignoring the law and conservatives that have been abiding by the law. Yes. Because Rainbow Push and the National Action Network are supposedly churches. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to laugh. And you mentioned those two organizations and church in the same sentence. But but if you look at them, if you if you go to Rainbow Push, they have church services. They 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 are they are supposedly a church. But yet and still, everything they do is partisan. The National Action Network, completely partisan. So it's been the liberals who have been completely, you know, flaunting the Johnson Amendment, but no one has ever gone after them for it. But they will sure go after an evangelical Southern preacher in a heartbeat. But now, if you know, if, if President Trump is true to his word, that is no longer going to be an issue, and we will be free to stay across our pulpits and engage in full democracy and not have our rights infringed by this arbitrary law. So, you know, President Trump. Like I said, as far as I'm concerned, he's still winning. Yep. So, Morris said, he's been in for two weeks, and he's done more for the evangelical community than any president has done that I can think of. I mean, truthfully, he's done more for the evangelical church, for, for Christians, than Ronald Reagan. I agree, brother. Yet you still got some, some folks out there going, I don't know about this Trump guy. I said, folks, sometimes the truth is right there in front of your eyes. Just look, and you can see it. Yeah. I mean, and he's done more for the evangelical community than any Republican and clearly any Democrat president that I can think of since I started voting for president. I agree, brother. Certainly more than the Bushes ever did. Right. And he's been in there for two weeks. Not even two yeah. weeks. So, you know, those those of our friends on the right who were skeptical of him, yes, I understand your skepticism. You know, I've, I've had to freely admit Donald Trump is no conservative, and in some ways he's barely a Republican. But considering what he's doing, I... I, I and say he's doing it. He's doing it. Church seems to like the church. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what more can you ask for? You know, so, you know, we need to take a commercial break, but the word says 
you will know them by the fruits that they bear. And this brother's bearing some fruit. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, don't go away. We'll be right back. Please heed this message from Pastor Donovan Larkin regarding protecting our children. Hello, I'm Donovan Larkins, pastor of Spirit of Life Christian Center in Dayton, Ohio. But I'm also the director of Shekinah Ranch and the Shekinah Ranch Protecting Innocence Campaign. And today I want to just share with you some of our materials that we've developed so that you can, you too can be part of promoting prevention, education, and safety awareness to you. We have now our, our Protecting Innocence T-shirt. Uh, it's a powerful marquee or billboard that you can purchase and wear yourself that brings awareness that children need advocacy. It's a powerful, powerful piece. It's simply a picture of that with this marquee here with, uh, with some additional wording on it. And you will want to be a part of it. Uh, we have posters that any of you pastors or any of you community centers, you may want to uh, obtain some of these posters and post in the recreation center. It would be great to post this in the foyer of your church. It would be awesome for you to post this throughout the school of, of, uh, of your community. Involvement is what's necessary. Involvement is what makes a difference. Uh, we know that in order for evil to triumph, all that is necessary is for good then we have these little marquees. You can take, you can order a hundred of them, you can order fifty of them, and you can pass them around to your family, you can pass them around to a family event or a local event that you're going to be at a festival or something. These are very handy, they're very cost efficient, and they make a powerful statement. They really make an impact. And then we have Protecting Innocence um, Ribbon. And in this package, it's not only just the ribbon, but it also has a message, a safety awareness message, actually a tip. Uh, and the tip encourages parents to exercise scrutiny with the relationships that your children are involved with. Today we see more and more children being victimized by teachers, by uh, coaches, and by other people, other supposedly trusted individuals. And we have to prepare our children with new plan for them to be safe. And then you will want to be involved with the overall Protecting Innocence campaign because we're making plans right now to build a, re a retreat recovery center on our 150 acre campus where Chicago Ranch is in this house. And you can get this brochure, you can, you can email it to you. Uh, that way there's no cost associated with it so that you can learn how you can join our protecting innocent team. We are communicating with people globally, all over the world that are interested in how together we can protect children from dirty, evil challenges. We love to have you on board. We need your support. We want your prayers. And we welcome your financial contributions. Again, I'm Donovan Larkin. The County Ranch Protecting Innocence Campaign. And by the way, camps are coming. And call us so that you can register your child. 937-422-6039. Good morning. I'm Michael Wright. And I'm Shannon Wright. Okay, folks, that's not how it goes. I think I'm Shannon and <laughs> you're so. Michael. Yeah. Okay. We are the right way with Shannon and Michael. Join us from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Live on SHR Media. And on TECM. 
where we'll be talking about all kinds of things. From sports and politics. Food and entertainment. To money. Family. And anything else in between. Community. Holidays. Community. It'll be great. Join us from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the final segment of The Right Guys. I'm Ralph J. Chittam Sr., and here with me is... I'm Lonnie Poindexter, and we are broadcasting from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., via FHR Media and the Exceptional Conservative Network. Well, you know, Lonnie, I, I have some some really, really disturbing news. Uh-oh. It seems as though... The snowflakes in Berkeley are rioting again. Ah. Yeah, and they're upset because Puxatani Phil saw his shadow. <laughs> <laughs> they feel that Puxatani is being discriminated against, right? Yeah, they're like those those Masons shouldn't rack that man that 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 rodent out of his hole. What's wrong with yeah? So so they're they're rioting over Puxatani Phil, man. These these people, I just don't know. Oh, well, I figured that was a cheap shot at them, so I figured I'd take it. <laughs> Might as well. Oh, th- there's a story that I read that hasn't been gotten any traction at all whatsoever from those in the grievance industry. It seems as though this um, young man, his name is Christian McNeely, and he attends school in Houston, Texas. And the teacher, it appears, gave the students an opportunity to earn extra credit in her class if they attended an anti-Donald Trump rally. But no offer was made of extra credit if anyone attended a pro-Donald Trump rally. Right. So this, this is so this is one situation that, that happened with um this um with Mr. McNeely in school. Um it seems as though he was speaking to another student in the class on another occasion about something and he and he said, Oh man, that's gay which is, you know, a term that a lot of people use regarding a situation. Well, it seems as though this teacher, this female teacher, took exception to that statement, was highly offended by that statement, and started berating this student in class. He picked up his phone to call his father to let his father know what was going on, and the teacher punched him in the chest. Oh. Okay. This story has not gotten any traction with my grievance industry folks over at News One, and I brought it to their attention. I was like, how come you aren't complaining about this? Um, I've seen nothing from Black Lives Matter. I've seen nothing from Talcum X. Um, oh, and for those of you who don't know who I'm referring to, I'm referring to that white man who insists that he's a black man whose real name is uh, Sean King, but I refer to him as Talcum X or Martin Luther Cream, <laughs> since since he insists on perpetrating the lie that he's black. And not even real cream, a non-dairy creamer. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. But n- none, none of these race, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, the ACLU, um, n- none of these race hustlers have said anything about this young man being abused because he is not one of them. He's not viewed as a leftist. So therefore, whatever he gets, he gets, and they don't have a problem with it. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that just goes to show you how hypocritical our friends on the left are. They only holler and scream if it's something bad that happens to one of them or one of theirs, but if something happens to a conservative or a Republican, because those two are not interchangeable terms, let's be honest about that, they don't have anything to say. It's almost as though, well, you deserve it because you're not on the plantation. 
Yes. <laughs> you know, it's it's almost um remember remember in the color purple when Harpo was talking to um Seely about how to deal with Sophia? Yes. And Seely said, beat her. Yeah. Yes, I remember. Well, th that's what's that's what's going on right now inside the black community. Yeah. When the when someone in the black community runs up against somebody who's a free thinker, who's off the plantation, and they go to somebody else in the black community, they ask, well, how am I supposed to deal with that person? They get the silly response. Beat them. And everybody co-signs and goes along with it because it's the acceptable thing to do. Yes. So, I, I just thought that, yeah, so when we get done with the show, yeah, good look at his name. It's Christian, which is ironic, <laughs> Christian McNeely. And he attends school in Houston. And this this story is getting no legs and no attention. Good fit the narrative. Right, exactly. But yet and still, you can have people like Sarah Silverman call for the military overthrow of the United States government. And she gets all kinds of positive press. She is dumb as a sack of hammers and that's doing disrespect to the hammers at least they know one or two things they do really well and uh, I see now why Jimmy Fallon dumped her smart man oh yeah absolutely um well um the daughter that you haven't met Lonnie um she's still she's still going to um, college um and she'll be graduating in May she's um and she's going to school also in Alabama and she started picking up the southern idioms these 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 southern sayings and some of them are absolutely hysterical and we were talking about someone earlier today and this is what my daughter said about this person she said this person is so dumb they couldn't pour water from a boot with directions on the heel <laughs> and my, and my first reaction was what did you just say? <laughs> this person is so dumb, they couldn't pour water from a boot with the directions on the heel. And she said, well, that's, that's one of those southern sayings that I, that I hear down here all the time. I'm like, that is hysterical. But you, that, that's pretty stupid. Yes. So, but yeah, but so this, this, is, this, this is what we're dealing with. This stupidity, along with this fascist Nazism um, from the anarchists, which are aligned with the leftists. And, you know, we just have to deal with that mindset. And we understand that when we step out, that little voice in somebody's ear, they're going to say, beat them. Yeah. And we, and we may just have to get physical. Yeah. That's where we are. It's really interesting how, the, how those things all link together. You wouldn't think that they would, but uh, historically, uh, radical Islam, um, the different isms, you know, fascism, Nazism, uh, socialism, communism, all tied back together. Yep. And it's all tied in with an anti-family agenda. There it is. Period. No, you, 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 you can say all you want, well, you know, Islam promotes family. It, no, it doesn't promote family. Not when a man can beat his wife, can divorce her, basically by just saying, I divorce you three times and walking away from her. When you can kill your daughter and say it's an honor killing and no one in the entire town is going to say a word. No, you cannot convince me that Islam is pro-family. And marry a nine-year-old or younger. Right. Put that out there too. And have relations with her. Yes. Not not just marry her, but actually have physical relations with the child. Yeah. No, you can't. There's no. You will not be able to convince me that that that's pro family. You know that's anti God. Because I I don't know what God you're praying to that finds that permissible. But hey. That's that, that's another rant for another show. <laughs> so, 
Oh, let me see. Let's what else? Oh, cabinet nominations. The Democrats are still playing games with that one. Um, we now have two female Republican senators, uh, Olympia Snow from Maine, and I forget the woman from, I think it's Alaska, who are saying they are going to vote against Betsy DeVos for uh, Education Secretary. It should be interesting. Right. But here is, see, this is what happens when you have smart people and grown-ups in government. <laughs> Um, oh, Jeff Sessions is still a United States Senator, and he will remain a United States Senator until his, until he is confirmed as a member of President Trump's cabinet. Yeah. Mike Pence, as the Vice President of the United States, would cast any vote in case of a tie in the United States Senate. Huh. So what is being set up is even if these two women vote against Betsy DeVos, if Jeff Sessions has not been confirmed yet, he can still vote for her, which would produce the tie in the Senate and then Mike Pence would cast the deciding vote and she would still head the education department. Wow. See, this is how grown-ups play the game. So all we have to do is make sure there are no other um, Republican defections. And truthfully, if we get one or two Democrats to vote for her, then um, Mike Pence casting the deciding vote to break the tie doesn't become necessary. But even if those two actually do vote against her, the Republicans still have a clear pathway for Donald Trump to get his education secretary. Yes. Don't you just love the political intrigue? It's just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for you poli sci majors. <laughs> and you know I'm being a bit facetious because it shouldn't come down to this. You know, it's it's like, you know, the the Democrats first, you know, set their sights on Jeff Sessions. You know, he he was the great Satan. You know, then now they've set their eyes on on Betsy DeVos because um, Orrin Hatch short circuited them with Price and I forget the other one's name when he said, "You don't want to show up to work for two days? Okay, we're going to change the rules and vote anyway." And so now their last hope of extracting a pound of flesh from somebody in, in Trump's cabinet is to go after Betsy DeVos as the education secretary. But even with that, um, like I said, the Republicans are playing hardball. These guys are grown-ups, and they are playing the game the way it's supposed to be played. And unfortunately, when a President Obama had the opportunity to do it in his first term, like we said just a few days ago, he showed that he lacked the huevos to do it. So that's not our fault. Nope. You know, they, they elected a weak president, and that's exactly what they got, was a weak president. Not my problem. But... Donald J. Trump is my president. Go, President Trump. Do what you got to do. And I've got your back. But I will tell you when I think you've done something wrong. I may not, I may, I may not do it publicly. But, you know, behind closed doors where it needs to be said, you know, I'll let you know. Um, no, I, I don't agree with that. But I'm not going to say anything publicly to give our patently misinformed people on the left any ammunition to use against my president. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of another stellar two hours of The Right Guys. So, we thank you for listening. And always remember, we are humans by race, Christians by faith, Americans by nationality, and conservatives by choice, because that is the only position that makes sense. And... and that we possibly eventually get to
something a tidbit or two. But I'm always up in this. There's still always, still always going to be right. Absolutely. God bless you, and we will see you tomorrow afternoon.